Um, what's our starting point? Where are we starting with this? How did this episode happen? Good question. Um, we, you and I, Jeremy, did an episode on how martial arts, traditional martial arts and MMA kind of intersected. Mm -hmm. And that led to just fights in general and movie fights and how they have changed throughout the course of time. And then that brought up, well, you know what? It's also affected, it may have affected professional wrestling as well. And so that's that's kind of how this came up of having an episode of how has martial traditional martial arts affected pro wrestling and potentially how has pro wrestling affected traditional martial arts. I think it's not going to be quite a two way street, but we'll, we'll we'll chat about it, figure it out. But that was kind of, that was my thought on the direction of this episode is, okay. you know, because there have been martial artists that have gone and done pro wrestling. Sure. Sure. I have okay. a list of them. Look at that. I, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm surprised, but impressed. All right. I wouldn't. I, well, I'd be more impressed if most of those were off the top of my head. I had to Google it. So I can, we can start with my John Cena story if you want. You remember the one where I was 13 years old and stood down the bullies because I wanted to be just like John Cena? Yeah. You should tell that story. Um, John Cena is not the actual wrestler. I just do that one because he's the most yeah, well known. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. so I, I, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start this like two minutes ago. So we're in the episode right now. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Even better. <laughs> just make sure, Craig. Just make sure you're talking to the camera. Oh yeah, let me flip you guys over. <laughs> Guys, I only play D and D on Zoom. That's all I do. All right. Well, well now better? you record on Zoom. Well, yeah, because yep. you're facing the camera. That's an important element. Uh, I guess. <laughs> I'm a I'm a live studio audience kind of guy. I'm not made for television. Tell right. tell your John Cena story. All right. <laughs> or your wrestling story, or however. Yeah. All however right. you're, so, you're calling it. So uh, I was. Uh, seventh grade at uh, the middle school I went to was sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and there were a whole bunch of kids. And um, there was a group of eighth grade kids who just constantly bullied my friends and I. That you know they would kind of threaten violence and and things like that. And I had been watching WWE for a couple of years, and finally one day, you know, after training for about a year and a half in in martial arts, and then my my need to be like John Cena. Um, came through they were walking into the school one day and some of the eighth graders were kind of you know picking on us saying things to a couple of my friends my friends were a little ahead of me so they went into the the building and it was just me and six of the other kids the bullies and so in my head I was like well, what what would John Cena do in this particular situation <laughs> so I spun around and faced all six of them and I looked at them and I went, so we're we just going to fight or, or what, what's going to happen here. Right. And the kid who was kind of like the ringleader, you know, the one who was in charge, he was going to be my WrestleMania main opponent. Right. Like that's what was going to happen. He walks up and gets in my face and in my head, I'm starting to freak out now. I'm like, Oh, I don't like to be hit. Like this is not going to go well for me. And the kid slapped me right in the face. He got my face and then he just Full on open hand slapped my face and I snapped to the side and I looked back at him and I went, Is it my turn now? Which in my mind was the coolest thing John Cena could have said in that moment. <laughs> and when that happened and they didn't see an emotional response, they didn't see me kind of cower back. They saw me kind of, you know, get a little bit more dominant and assertive. They instantly backed off and left us alone after that. Um, practicality wise right like as a martial arts instructor now i would advise anyone to not stand down six people and threaten to fight them all at wrestlemania um but at the time uh one of the things that it the correlation between what professional wrestling gave me as a teenager and what martial arts gave me as a teenager was that confidence right like that i had people i could look up to 
that sure i mean if you watch wwe you know aw any of those professional wrestling things you should probably also watch general hospital you'll get roughly the same story <laughs> right there's just a little less yeah. tables right um but it still gives you that same mentality of there's a hero, there's a villain, there's you're fighting for what's right, and you have that sort of correlation, um, which in my mind is is if you look at somebody who says I started martial arts because I watched a Bruce Lee movie, or I started martial arts because I watched a Karate Kid, or I was being bullied. Well, professional wrestling can have that same effect, and yeah, it's a bunch of dudes. You, angry and aggressive and stuff and they're yelling at each other and sweating on each other and and stuff but at the same time there's there's that bit of like hey if they can do it so can i and it you know i guess to me that's one of the biggest correlations between the two right it it, is that sort of that sort of um might for right i guess would be the best way to put it you know right well (sighs) So that, that, I think that gives the audience a good primer on your love for wrestling. I, I don't think we need to go any deeper. I think they can piece that together based on that story pretty cleanly. But of course, we're here today to talk about that, that overlap between what we do as martial artists and what happens in professional wrestling. And I, I think it's easy to equate professional wrestling with WWE, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Right. There, there's a lot more out there. There are plenty of other wrestling promotions, just in the same way that MMA and UFC are kind of synonymous, but they're not actually. There's there's more going on in the world of MMA from you know big pro circuits down to backyard amateur MMA. Right. Uh, I know my early introductions to wrestling, but I'm curious, like Andrew, do you have any? background do you watch wrestling as a kid at all so i was never one that watched a lot of uh wwe or wwf or you know whatever it was f back then yeah yeah it was yeah it was the wwf i mean uh it, it it's that's that's just how it was back then um we i had a number of friends that were big into it as when, when i was in high school and so we would i would never watch it on a regular basis but when uh summer slam or the royal rumble or all these like special pay-per-view things came out uh Mm -hmm. my good friend matt would always his family would would purchase the pay-per-view and a bunch of us would all go over there and watch and so my indoctrination into uh professional wrestling was in the Hulk Hogan era, the mm. Ultimate Warrior, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, like, you know, the, the old school. In, and of course, because I'm Scottish, Rowdy Roddy Piper, of course, mm-hmm. that was my first introduction to professional wrestling. I never got into it. Like, in, I mean, I don't want to say I didn't enjoy watching it, but it wasn't something that I would go out of my way to watch. But when a bunch of friends got together to watch it, I was all over that. That's pretty much my story too. So we, we don't we don't need to unpack that. It's it, it very much what you just said. Uh, Craig, I think we're going to consider you the wrestling expert. I mean, definitely out of the three of us, you are the wrestling expert. That's a heavy and title. So I think the the first place we need to go is what's the earliest that you're aware of where martial arts as we would think of martial arts was showing up in pro wrestling. So it's actually an interesting corollary. Um, I'd say at the beginning stages of pro wrestling, it was more of martial arts as you would see it as opposed to now. Um, Professional wrestling had um, its ties, you know, the the really prominent people who kind of gave it that life um, were catch wrestlers and submission grapplers. Mm and greco-roman wrestlers um you know so there's definitely there's an actual legitimate wrestling piece to professional wrestling now of course you know my the biggest opposition right that that we we will hear because we hear it all the time as a fan of pro wrestling is that it's fake um and fake to me isn't the right word it's scripted right it's a tv show it's a tv show for sure um but the ring that they land on 
is plywood covered in canvas with a little spring so that you don't break the wood. Those ropes is regular rope with electrical tape wrapped around it. Like it's not, it's not as gentle sport, you know? Um, so I would say probably if you go back to like Andrew said, like Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, Roddy Roddy Piper, back towards the, you know, the eighties, even the seventies, um, you'd find more um, martial arts related stuff mm. than you would now. Um, but that's not to say that there isn't any now. There's very talented martial artists that perform in WWE right now. Um, sure. But I think the bulk of what the brand and the product was back then is more in line with like physical martial arts skills. Okay. So that kind of predates any of, any of my time watching wrestling you know I, I i watched a little bit in the late 80s and back then it was my memory of it was so simplistic you know if there was a if there was a kick it wasn't a good kick um mm -hmm. with the the possible exception of the you know the running jumping double kind of two foot out drop kick, kick. drop kick yeah yeah that that's i mean i remember that punches weren't good so we're what do you know what created that change because you know we're talking about the two-way relationship here between wrestling and martial arts and if it started martial arts obviously it changed yeah got, so got I, well less I, martial artsy I, well i think uh, to a mainstream audience right because you try to appeal to a mainstream audience watching two people get on a canvas and wrestle for 15 minutes is not exciting mm -hmm right? Like it doesn't get me on the edge of my seat. So then you start throwing in some punches and some kicks. But they, like you said, I mean, you, if you watch them now and you're like, you're clearly missing this person. Like you clearly, <laughs> you're not even close. Yeah. I see you stomping on the mat to make the noise. Like, you know, there are times when they're hitting and they're actually hitting and you can tell. And then there are times where they're not. Um, and I think for a long time, it was a fine line. I would say in my opinion, that the striking aspect of martial arts is showcased better today than it ever has been. Mm. Um, and I think it was an evolution. It went from real legitimate Greco-Roman catch wrestling, submission grappling into this, we're going to strike and have some of this. And then into, okay, now we can kind of merge the two. And what's what's been interesting over the past four or five years is um and i speak to wwe because that's the company i i know the best and have always and grew mm -hmm. up with they are actively searching for a way to get that same kind of like ufc style product mm -hmm. using professional wrestling as the vehicle so mm -hmm. they'll have a tale of the tape right this person's win loss record this how tall how much reach they have none of that stuff has any bearing on the show <laughs> itself other than they're just trying to give it that same appeal um you know and, and i think it's gotten more prominent in martial arts circles the past few years especially with ronda being in wwe and th there's a clear delineation i think between a martial artist of her caliber right olympic black belt judo like mm. when she goes in the ring and she throws someone she's throwing them and you can tell like there's a there's a marked difference between the teamwork that's needed to do some of the moves they do and just her going, nope, you're going. And she just mm -hmm. dumps them. Um, but even like um, Shane McMahon, so Vince McMahon owns it. His son, Shane, trains mm -hmm. in Muay Thai and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Mm -hmm. um, he trained, he trains, I don't remember the coach's name, mm -hmm. his Muay Thai coach um, was one of the people who taught striking to George St. Pierre. And he does Brazilian jiu-jitsu with Henzo Gracie. So like he does, he does actual martial arts training. And again, you can tell because he goes in and he Muay Thai's the wrestlers who are used to their craft and it's just a totally different response. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you're right, Jeremy, like they take strides. I remember back in the day, one of the most devastating moves you could ever get hit with was the claw. Do either of you? Yeah, it's this. Yep, I and remember the claw. You could get gripped so tight in the forehead that you passed out, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't. 
I don't know. Now, Maybe. No. The other thing that the other thing that's interesting is that you know, Jeremy, you, we were talking, you know, talking about the, the early days, and you know, it, it's kind of progressed. But but even in the early days, you know, when I was watching, it would have been the late eighties, early nineties. Um, you know, I was at that point started to get involved in martial arts, and I do remember there were one or two pro wrestlers that were touted as being martial artists. Um, and I could be wrong on the the person, and Craig, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm I'm pretty sure Jimmy Superfly Snuka was he was from Fiji, and one of his things was like he studied like martial mm. arts. That was his thing, and he would fly through the air with his kicks and things. Um, and there was another one, um, something Hongo, I think. But he was from Japan, and I just remember he either had a headband or maybe his shorts, whatever, had the rising sun Japanese flag on it. And so even then, in the early days, they tried to get a little bit of martial art flair into the pro wrestling. But I I wouldn't go so far as to say that it really stuck Mm. until more recently when we have had like you mentioned craig ronda rousey and a a handful of other um martial artists join professional wrestling yeah well what's interesting is i think the um jimmy snooker i remember him they say he has martial arts experience i have no evidence to say he does like i don't but they he was built that way it may have just been that they were touting yeah. that he did, even though he didn't, you know? Yeah, and I give you I give you points. It was Tonga. Tonga is who you were thinking of from Japan. Tonga. That's that's pretty good. That was a search for a second. If you saw me smile, it's because nice. I had to, like, dig way. <laughs> it was down in the bottom of my head. Um, so <laughs> um, what's really fascinating is that pro wrestling has such a hold on Japanese culture and it's mm. so different than american culture right have have either of you ever been to like a professional wrestling show jeremy i know you haven't because we talked about them. all right no. they are the loudest most rowdiest inappropriate there's signs everywhere like it is like there are people screaming kill him right like on the like it's it's wild right wow. okay when you go to japan you sit quietly during the whole match and you pay very close attention like it is a very formal thing to go to a pro wrestling event there and so it's very interesting that there was a correlation um between the there's a there's a an organization in japan right now called new new japan pro wrestling and it's pretty new and it was um if i'm remembering correctly it was founded by a guy named antonio inoki i think i pronounced that right and he actually was one of the first pro wrestling crossovers to MMA at the time. I think it was 1971. He fought Muhammad Ali. Hmm. Wow. Oh, okay. So he, he, his, his wrestle his background was in professional wrestling and then he fought Muhammad Ali and they tried to bridge that gap a little bit where I don't, I don't remember how that went, but I do know that it kind of like was the first kind of crossover. Hmm. Um, and then after that, there was a lot in the early days of UFC where like Ken Shamrock or um, Dan Severin, they were in UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship at the time, and WWF at the time, at the same time. Um, and so there's been a lot of kind of overlap where, you know, there's people with legitimate skills. Now, do they get that character when they sign up? Probably not, not necessarily. Um but they, but you're right where there's that cool kind of correlation between the two. There are people who leave pro wrestling to go to MMA or kickboxing and vice versa. It's, it's like a revolving door almost. And, and I think the, the one that is most interesting to me there is Brock Lesnar because it's like he can't make up his mind what he wants yeah. to do. And I, and I look at the two and you know you take someone like him or someone like ronda rousey who you know know what it's like to be at or near the top of their competitive sports and then step into mma with all these promises and they do well maybe financially because of their notoriety but it is it is absolutely brutal the preparation and the competition in mma versus this is not to take anything away from pro wrestling but on your best day you're not going to get nearly as hurt in pro wrestling 
as even your best day, I'd say, in MMA. Well, and that's that's an interesting point. I I see where you're going. I, I disagree a little bit in that the in professional sports, we call it sports entertainment, right? Wrestling. Sure. Um, I, I firmly believe that they're all athletes, so I'm I'm comfortable calling it yeah, scripted. I, I I have um, no problem with that. They Wait, it's, the, it's scripted. It's not real. It's re- Andrew. I just said it's real, but it's scripted. <laughs> it really hurts. I've uh, uh, hold on. I can't go off on a tangent yet. Um, they so a professional wrestler, last I knew, has to perform in that ring like 360 days a year like it's a ridiculous amount of performance yeah, that's insane the, they get they get very little downtime to rest and recover and that's including if you're sprained if you're like mm-hmm. if you li- like cannot move then you don't you don't perform but there were days especially like in the 80s with you know where they would travel around they'd wrestle eight times a week um you know, and, and there's a different wear and tear on the body MMA for sure. Right. They're getting punched in the face, they're getting locks, stuff like that. You know, the, the wrestling guys, they're jumping off of ladders. Like you can't fake that landing. Right. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that they're, that it's not intensive. I'm not suggesting it's brutal on the body, but I I think there, there, there are two points here and, and I'm going to kind of run with this because this is setting up what I want to say next there's a big difference between someone trying to hurt you as in Mm -hmm. combat sports and someone trying to work with you in professional wrestling. There, there's a recognition, my understanding within the culture that they are on the same team. They are trying to both sell it. They have their roles, they have their characters, but if you and I are matched up and I hurt you too many, one too many times, you are unhappy and it affects our performances and thus our job. And there's a recognition of that versus yep. MMA, where if we're in the ring together, I am trying to hurt you. Yep. And I think we can also look at the length of careers. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at some of these guys who have, I mean, there are people in the ring who were in the ring when we were children mm-hmm. and they are still doing it. That does not happen in MMA. Mm-hmm. I'm not aware of anybody who's at a, a top level, you know, that would equate to a Hulk Hogan or an undertaker who, Mm -hmm. you know, 30, 40 years of putting their body on the line. Not that they're not paying a price for it. I want to go back to what you said about professional wrestling, WWE specifically, looking at MMA and trying to take a page out of their book. Because I think this is one of the things that I find fascinating, most fascinating about pro wrestling, is the, the collective willingness to suspend disbelief in a way, in this kind of the same way that we watch martial arts films. When we watch any martial arts film, we see ridiculous things. We watch Crouching Tiger and we see people doing these really cool, but not real things, you know, walking on treetops or whatever. I'm thinking of Martial Journal because issue two is right here, walking on treetops. Um, The first article in there is great. It is, it is. I wonder who wrote it. Uh, The... I think you could make a similar observation about pro wrestling in that while it is real, they are really, you know, beholden to the laws of gravity and, and other laws of physics. Mm -hmm. There is still, we're collectively suspending disbelief in the fact that the people in the ring are not trying to kill each other. They're not trying Mm -hmm. to harm each other. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I, I agree. Yeah. If that is the case, is there an instinctive thing that they are playing on to pull from other combat sports to try and make it look more real? What do you think? Yeah, I think that there's, I think that there's definitely an aspect of that. Um, and I think one of the, uh, how do I want to say it? One of the things that's a really interesting cor- correlation between the two is that if you really think about it, from the first Ultimate Fighting Championship till to today, those two companies kind of grew side by side in a way, but mm-hmm. never really like Dana White and Vince McMahon never like hung out together. You know what I mean? They mm-hmm. they both did their own thing and grew into huge pop cultural phenomenons, right? Like mm-hmm. huge. And 
Um, we see it the other way too. If you remember UFC, at least I, I, this is how I'm remembering it. Um, there wasn't always the, the trash talking as much as there is now. There wasn't no. always kind of like the character play that there is now. They got all of that from professional wrestling, mm-hmm. right? Like there, there are plenty of martial artists who go, if I wanted to watch a bunch of people being sweaty and screaming at each other, I'd turn on WWE, right? I just want to watch technical ability and prowess. So it's, it's an interesting correlation that WWE is trying to take from UFC this um, legit fight feel, right? Like this, like, here's the tail of the tape. Here's how they train. Here's what they do. And then UFC is trying to take from WWE. This is how we tell a story to get you emotionally invested, right? Interesting, yeah. If you love him or hate him, you're going to tune in to watch Conor McGregor either punch someone in the face or get punched in the face. It's one or the other. Either way, mm-hmm. you're paying the $75 for the paper. And eh. and that was the whole thing, right? Like for you had Hulk Hogan in the 80s and you had Ric Flair. Hulk Hogan was say your prayers, eat your vitamins and Ric Flair was poking people in the eyes and kicking them in the groin. You know, <laughs> it was just two totally different. But you either tuned in to watch Hulk Hogan body slam Andre the Giant or you tuned in to watch someone punch Ric Flair in the face. It was one mm-hmm. or the other. So I think it's an interesting dynamic between the two or duality is probably a better word between the two because they're both trying to take from each other and it's just kind of making this interesting kind of comparison that that's interesting um i hadn't thought of that going the other way like you know i've seen some of the mma stuff get carried over into uh wwe but i hadn't thought of that a lot of the trash talk stuff that happens in the UFC now is very much a a persona, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that it's just put on to sell tickets, right? And I hadn't thought of that correlation. That's interesting. I'm I'm interested as well if and you know Craig, I'm, again, we're we're gonna I'm gonna ask you to kind of field this question. I remember watching WWF when I was a kid and what the fighting was like and I fighting I put in quotes right because it is it is scripted and but even then you could tell that it was fake like I mean I had I was studying martial arts at the time and I know what a front kick supposed to look like and their front kicks didn't come out straight towards the opponent it kind of came straight up into the belly right and then they jump and, you know, they make the sound with the foot because the other foot's hitting the floor. Like, since martial artists have been gravitating somewhat into professional wrestling, has it changed the way the fights happen now? Do they look more realistic? Do they look with any sort of technique better than it was back in the 80s? Yeah, so, so it's funny. So as I'm listening and thinking about it, in certain aspects, yes, right? In certain aspects, like I said, um, you know, Shane McMahon gets out there and he's throwing jab, 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 body. He's going to the body. He's going to the head. He's doing all this stuff. You know, so, um, Undertaker is a black belt Brazilian jiu-jitsu, if I'm remembering correctly. So he gets someone on the ground and he's trying to do like a, a guillotine choke. You know, Brock Lesnar goes in. His original move was to put somebody on his shoulders, pop him up and drop him on his face. He goes to UFC and he comes back and it's a Kimura shoulder lock. That's how we, mm. that's how we went. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So now don't get me wrong. Brock Lesnar still flips them and slams them on their face. Cause that's the part everyone's like, that's so the cool. F- the F5. The F5. That's right. Um, but there's, so it's really interesting because I, again, yes and no, because mm. in the eighties and nineties, they didn't have, I don't want to say they didn't have incredible athletes because they did. But they also struggled a lot with substance abuse, you know, steroids, alcohol, drugs. And so sometimes you had people in the ring who very clearly weren't in the right state of mind. And their their ability to do the things that the performers do now is different. But they were great getting on a microphone and getting getting an emotional response from you. So the moves Mm -hmm. didn't have to be so clean, per se, because... It was believable in a way that these two people hate each other and they're just pummeling each other, right? So I would say now, if I had to equate professional wrestling matches now, they're more like Hollywood budget fights, right? 
when I That's talk what I was to gonna people, say. when I talk to people about pro wrestling, they say, "Why do you love that? It's fake." I say, "Because it's a beautiful art form in stunt fighting mm-hmm. and teamwork." And because if you think about, you can button down any piece of what it takes to be a pro wrestler, and it's stunt fighting. It's head snaps. It's body shots. Mm-hmm. It's moving. Um, there is an actual. This was a story I said I'd come back to. There is an actual method to getting hit with a steel chair. Okay, so it, it's really I would hope cool. so. Well, it's well. See, when I was younger, I thought you just take the chair and just right. Um, that explains. I've been, I've, I've been hit with a steel chair. <laughs> um, a couple of years ago, I had the great opportunity to actually host John Cena's dad, John Cena Senior, here at the Karate School. He gave a motivational speech to the kids. He brought in John Cena's WWE Championship belt. It was a lot of fun. And he hung out afterwards for a little bit. Hmm. And he, um, and I asked him, right? Like, cause I couldn't help it. I was, I was, you know, being an Uber fan. I was like, can you please hit me with a chair? So I gave him a chair and he showed me how they do it. It was super neat. Um, and, and the, the methods and the science behind it has to be held a certain way, hit a certain way. Um, it was almost martial arts in the sense of breaking down which parts of the body you can hit to do the least damage as opposed to conversely mm. we often focus on where to hit to get somebody away from you mm. so it it was cool in that sense to hear kind of the science and the art form behind what they do mm. um, ah. there was um I recently had the opportunity to to do a short session with michael jai white and he spent some of it talking to us about stunt fighting and or I, I should say movie choreography and he he spoke about this one particular movie early in his career where he got out there and, and, and this is this is responding to what you're saying andrew this idea that you know he, he's a really skilled martial artist and he's getting out there and he's putting on what we would essentially call a clinic but when he watched the movie later it didn't look good he, in fact he described it as, as looking very poor because the reality of of, of technical martial arts is not the same as what looks good on camera and i would imagine that the vast majority of people in professional wrestling their technical abilities far surpass what they are displaying on camera because they have to right like we fall back on our lowest level of training tiktok recently has been showing me a lot of pro wrestling clips and there was one that came up that that really stuck with me from about a week ago and it was Ronda Rousey. She was in the ring and there was an exchange and she th- rolls someone over her shoulder and you watched her and you could see her. St- she just, she kind of flinched. Like she, she had an arm bar and she started to go for it. And there was like, Nope, that's not where I am. I have to let this person escape and slide out of the ring, but she was there. She was ready for it. And that, I found really fascinating because you can think about those those individuals who have done double duty, especially someone like a Brock Lesnar who keeps changing his mind where he's going to go. That's got to be really difficult. Mm -hmm. I'm using, because the skill sets are similar enough. I would be terrified. I would be utterly terrified to train Mm -hmm. for a full contact fight and get really good at that. And then I'm going into pro wrestling where I'm not, you know, I'm going to be in big trouble if I break someone's arm. Mm. Yeah, I think I think it's interesting because especially you see that with people who have trained an awful lot that they they do almost hesitate for a second because it's muscle memory at a certain point, right? Yeah. Um, it's also really cool to watch Rhonda do some of the things she does in a professional wrestling ring and watch how the wrestlers respond. Like you said, you know, earlier, it's teamwork, right? Mm -hmm. So my job, if, if, you know, Andrew versus Craig versus Jeremy for the WWE championship at WrestleMania, let's make that happen. We'll manifest that. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm in. All right. Free training day, 2022. (laughs) I know what I'm teaching. I know what I'm teaching this year. All right. I'm in. Um, but it's really interesting because um, it's my job to make you two look great, mm. right? And so when they do, a lot of people remember, you know, who have wrestling, like who watched it in the 80s or stuff, 
remembers WrestleMania three. That's the one where Hulk Hogan scoop body slams Andre the Giant. No one thought anyone could lift Andre the Giant, right? Right. And that was a huge moment. But what a lot of people don't realize is Hogan wasn't lifting Andre as much as Andre was lifting himself. Yeah, jumping. Hogan had, yeah, Hogan had to provide the base so Andre could push off his hips, right? And and the really good wrestlers make it look like that's not even happening, right? And so um, with Ronda, because she doesn't need help throwing someone over her head, if you if you pay close enough attention, because I always watch the other person, I'm really fascinated to see how you make other people look good. Mm. Um, they go limp for Ronda. Mm. They go Which 100% makes sense. limp. Makes sense. Which if you're slapping out, right? I've been thrown by judo black belts. First of all, it's a really fast ride that I didn't buy a ticket for. And second, um, if you don't go limp, it hurts. If you go limp, you can slap out much easier. And so it makes absolute sense. And the first time Ronda was in the ring, no one went limp, right? No, they all did what they were trained to do. Hmm. And I read somewhere, and I, and I like to believe it's true because I see a lot of improvement there that Rhonda actually went into a ring with all of them and showed them how to break fall better, like showed them how to slap out and that sort of skill set, um, which one obviously helps make her look better when she's doing her thing, but two, it also helps improve the quality of safety. Yeah, sure. I would, that's exactly where I was going to get at. Like it keeps them safer. Um, you know, we, we, I talk about this in, in our dojo all the time when we are working on break falls or we're working on locks or joint manipulation stuff about just be loose and go with it. And, you know, we, I've had some people say, well, you know, you're by, by doing that, you're training the participant to, uh, you know, to have it happen to them. And it's like, no, it's, it's not that I'm making it easier for the person doing the technique. It's I'm making it safer for you, right? We've all seen or may have seen videos of people who skiers skiing down these huge slopes, and then they just, they, they take a huge digger, and they, they fall hundreds and hundreds of feet, and they get to the bottom, and they're not hurt. And why are they not hurt? Because they're trained to go limp. And when there's resistance, that's when something breaks, right? Mm -hmm. And so it makes sense that I would not have thought of that with Rhonda coming in to wrestling, but it totally makes sense. Totally yeah. makes sense. It, it's really cool. And to watch the people who are trained at, to a level of falling that others aren't, for example, if you watch WWF in the 90s, you probably know who like the Hardy Boys are, right? Like Jeff Hardy and Matt Hardy. D Jeremy just, yeah, I know them. You're talking they're, my they're era. Whole, that their was my era of wrestling. Stick, their whole shtick was jumping off of ladders onto people on a table. Like that was the mm -hmm. whole thing. And so if you, again, if you don't watch the person doing the jumping, but you watch the person who's getting landed on, there's a certain way they brace themselves and roll at the last second to be safe. And they have ways of communicating. Um, that's really interesting. Um, for example, um, you know, there was one bit, uh, I don't remember it, late 90s, a wrestler named Bubba Ray Dudley, again, probably from Jeremy's era, did this move called a powerbomb. He took an 85-year-old woman who was a wrestler back in the 50s. I remember were, that. I remember that. He put her on his shoulders and jumped off the stage through a table with her. So she was, he was sitting, she had her, the back of her knees on his hips at that point. And if you watch close, you'll see her right hand squeeze his calf. And that was their sign that she's okay. So he mm. could just keep doing what he was doing. So they have, they have, they have a whole language that they can speak to each other the whole time too, which is really fascinating to me. Mm. Um, you know, so, another what, great example. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 take this one and then we'll we'll move on. Okay. I was going to say another great example of um, a really high level martial artist in, in freestyle wrestling that did incredibly well in professional wrestling is Kurt Angle. He was a wrestler. Mm -hmm. He came in in the mid 90s um, or late 90s. He wrestled in the 96 Olympics for the United States and won a gold medal. Um, and he went on to have a, you know, 25 year career, um, just recently retired. But when you watch him move and the way he was able to modify and adapt 
his skill, kind of like to your point earlier, um, Jeremy, it, it makes a difference for everyone. So I think a martial arts impact in professional wrestling makes professional wrestling safer. And, and I think this just goes further to the, the point that I've made many, many times on the show. It's all roughly the same, right? We can only move in so many different ways. And, yep. you know, yeah, we're talking, you know, I, I think we probably are a bit striking centric because of our audience and because of our, Andrew, our personal experiences, but we acknowledge grappling and pro wrestling has far more going on on the grappling side of things. And it's, you know, I find it really interesting to watch, but I would guess, you know, we, we've given quite a few examples of people who were traditionally legitimate wrestlers, judo players, et cetera, who have moved in and while it's not exactly the same same skill set, it's closer than you know being a professional boxer and moving in or something, something like that. Because our audience is traditional martial artists, we've talked a lot about really the 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 influences and the push into pro wrestling, but we we started getting into some things that I think would be interesting for us to talk about, kind of coming back out this this nonverbal communication. Um, and an understanding of how to train without injuring people. That's a thing that we don't spend a ton of time on, but out of necessity in pro wrestling, it is imperative because of, as you mentioned earlier, Craig, the sheer volume of work that they're doing, the number of days that they're doing. They, they can't, you know, it's not like you come out of a fight and you've got three months to recover before you start your next fight camp. You've got mm -hmm. tonight for many of them. So as someone who has been a wrestling fan for a long time and a martial artist for a long time, what do you take or think we should be taking from wrestling back into our training? Um, well, uh, so I'm going to give two answers, right? So one is as a martial arts student and one would be as a martial arts teacher because believe it or not I found that professional wrestling helped me become a better teacher Ooh, and so we'll talk about, about that, that. yeah okay um so from a martial arts standpoint one to go to Andrew's point earlier right about joint manipulation falling right like you should be somewhat compliant now that doesn't mean completely compliant but somewhat compliant because if you slap a wrist lock on someone who's fighting you the wrist is going to lose that fight if you're doing it properly yeah. yep right if you're not limp when you're falling and i don't care if somebody pushed you over right like i don't care what the self-defense implication is if you're in the air and the ground is coming quickly you need to relax like the ground doesn't care if someone pushed you or you slipped on ice yep right mm. so <clears throat> so from a martial arts student standpoint, what I would say is the ability to read the cues of others, adapt on the fly is really important, and understand teamwork. And, and what I mean by that is not just like a consensual, you know, Andrew and I are sparring today. So, you know, Andrew, I'm working kicks, you work punches, not that. Yeah. In a self-defense situation, somebody step in throwing a right haymaker punch well consider that teamwork they're feeding you something how are you going to adapt to it to get the better the better result in your situation so that i think is really important as a student um as a martial arts teacher uh, every teacher has days where they're not at their best right every yeah. no matter what's going on in your life no matter how much you tie that belt knot no matter how much you get yourself in the right frame of mind man some days are just tough because we're human and in those days are the days I almost always resort back to going, all right, professional wrestler today. I'm a little bit louder. I'm a little bit more animated. I'm a little bit more get up and go mm. because I'm teach. I'm treating it almost a little bit less of a class and more of a show where I'm giving you knowledge, right? So mm. that helped. And what happens is that breaks it. It makes it more fun for me. So then it, eventually that kind of breaks out the day. Um, so professional wrestling speaks to so many people. I mean, WWE is a multi-billion dollar industry, right? So it speaks to a lot of people. There's no which way about it. 
And the reason why I would argue is that it's an emotional response to the larger than life characters. People see people that they want to be, right? And when you're a martial artist and you tell people you're a martial artist, you tell people you're a black belt, there's a part of them that probably wishes they were too. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but for me, obviously my whole identity is wrapped up in martial arts is my career. It's what I do. Right. And, but whenever somebody sees me on the street and says, what do you do? And I say, I'm a martial arts instructor. The first question, are you a black belt? The second question or the second response, man, I don't want to make you mad. Right. And I usually look at them. I'm like, yeah, that's probably true. Right. Like I just laugh it off. I mean, I don't really get angry. Like I just, that's not an emotion I feel frequently. So, um, but the ability to um, almost be this persona in a way, I think is, is important because it helps you carry yourself better, right? You're a black belt and you're, te and you're teaching humility. You're teaching perseverance, indomitable spirit. You're teaching all of these qualities and sometimes stepping out of yourself and saying, I'm going to be this person today helps you make that happen. Um, and ultimately can make you a better person. So as cliche as it sounds, wrestling was there for me in times when I really needed a, a role model um, and someone to speak to. And a lot of times they say, don't meet your heroes, right? Like hmm. Jeremy, you and I have told, talked about this. Yeah. Um, my favorite wrestler for anyone who's a wrestling fan is, is Shawn Michaels. He was always my favorite. He was super charismatic. He was never the biggest person in the fight, but he always put on the coolest show. And he um, has a great sidekick. Yeah, he does. And he has a very solid, accurate sidekick. And to my knowledge, no formal martial arts training. Mm. That's just, he decided his finishing move was a sidekick to the chin. He called it sweet chin music, which by the way is the coolest name for any sidekick ever. Okay. <laughs> um, if I could kick someone in the chin, I'd probably do sweet chin music, but uh, we'll do sweet chin music. We'll hit him in the shin. Um, and, uh, but, but the thing was for me, when I met him, I was nervous, right? Like I was like, don't meet your heroes. You're going to be disappointed. Like they're, the, he is not who he is on TV. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that happened when I met him was he was getting ready. Like I, I go to comic cons, you know, you guys know that. And he was at one and I was in line to meet him and get his autograph and just thank him for being a profound impact on my life. And I was third person in line and he goes, he sits down and goes, okay, I'm ready. And then they almost bring the first person up and goes, wait, hold on. You guys don't want to see me yet. And he reached into his bag, pulled out a case, clipped it open. He goes, I got to put my teeth in. All the teeth he had lost over the years weren't in his mouth anymore. And I was like, dude, how often do you forget? Like, that was the first question. It broke the ice for me. I was like, how often do you forget to put your teeth in? And he looked at me, he goes, brother, more times than I can count. <laughs> and it kind of broke the ice and he was super yeah. duper gracious and nice. So the other thing I would say about professional wrestling is they're doing it because they're passionate about it. It's not just a job mm. to them. And that's a correlation in martial arts. Any martial mm. artist you meet that this is their job, we don't do it because we're trying to get rich. We do it because we're passionate about what we do and we believe in what we do. And so when somebody gets the opportunity to meet us and be excited about it, um, we should be excited too because that means somewhere we made an impact. That's a very good point. I, I like that. Mm. Yeah, there are certainly easier ways to make a living. So, Jeremy, who's your favorite wrestler? When I was a little kid, it was the Ultimate Warrior. Okay, yeah. But when I was watching mm -hmm. in kind of that that late '90s, early 2000s, it was like three or four years, I had a college roommate who was into it, and so we would watch and that you know, later became more of like a, like a dorm thing. We would have, you know, five, 10 people come down and we would all watch. Um, and at the, at the time, uh, probably the Hardy boys, you know, cause I identified they were certainly much smaller than most of the other guys in the ring. And I really appreciated their athleticism. And fun facts about both ultimate warrior and Hardy boys, since that's why you've got me here. Ultimate Warrior WWE has an award named after him now for oh. this called the Ultimate Warrior Award. And it's given to people who overcome 
a lot of hardship and stuff like that. So mm. it's gone to people, you know, kids who have been fighting cancer or people oh, like that. That's really cool. So every year at WrestleMania season, they have their Hall of Fame, right? And somebody always wins the Ultimate Warrior Award, and it's always for persevering some sort of hardship. Hmm. Um, as for the Hardy Boys, do you know where they train professional wrestling? I'm guessing somewhere local. In their backyard. They had no coach. <laughs> wow. Okay. They, they were, their, their first championship belts that they had um, were made out of cardboard. They made them themselves, and they used to wrestle in the backyard on a trampoline. That's how they came up with jumping off ladders through tables and this, that, and the other thing, was it was, they were homegrown, trained backyard. themselves. Wow. Yeah. Challenging, challenging each other. Mm -hmm. I, I actually know some phenomenal martial artists who have sort of that story. You know, they had each other. They didn't, they were able to do some very interesting things because what they figured out was not the status quo mm -hmm. and it served them well. And so that, that's kind of cool to know. What about you, Andrew? Who's your favorite? Um, so my favorite uh, back from the early nineties, um, he, he was uh, very well known and became well known for doing some commercials for Slim Jim. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, your education got you down. Snap into a Slim Jim. <laughs> so good. The you have to talk man. in that voice forever now. Yep. Randy uh, Macho Man Savage. Uh, you know what, Andrew? We should get you one of his outfits for free trade day. D don't give and, Jeremy a heart attack. <laughs> and what was... And do, you, do you remember what his entrance music was? Oh, God. I don't, actually. I don't. So... This is my favorite Macho Man Randy Savage thing because you'd think there'd be like it'd be like welcome to the jungle, right? Like that. Ugh, he's, he, yeah. he walked out to pomp and circumstance. It was like a high school graduation every time he walked oh, out. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yep. It was like this costume, <laughs> just, and he'd walk out. And he'd be like all jacked up, and it was just like such a quiet like song. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I think we need more entrance music for martial arts events. I think that's the I've, number one I've thing we that. can take. Yep. And, yep. When and, we... and there's a there's a sarcastic element to it, but there's also a real element to it. I, I, I genuinely think that music can can fill a space. We, we've talked about music in yeah. training on the show quite a few times. So so what would your entrance song be? You're the best around. Never gonna let me get you down. You're the best. Andrew, Andrew yeah. what's the theme song from Best of the Best? Uh, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> no, we got to find it. That'll be Jeremy's walkout music. Uh, no, no, but we're going to have a best of the best match. And the winner, me, gets to make sure that you can't watch that movie or talk about it ever again. No. Oh, boy. Well, this uh, is good. This is, this is great, guys. That was so much fun. We're, we this got two more hours of, of this, right? I could talk wrestling for another few hours. I, 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 I'm sure you could. Well, you know, the, this brings what we're talking about here to a close, but, but I, I think it's important that we let people know, you know, we don't have to close the door on the subject, especially if there's something more specific that we should go into. You know, there's a lot that I think we could do if we were demonstrating uh, I think there is a, a huge amount of value as demonstration teams observing what happens in professional wrestling. You know, there's a lot we could go into there. So uh, if people have ideas or questions for follow-ups, reach out, we'll do it. I have a professional wrestling friend. I could bring him on. That would be so much fun. I, I mean, okay, to... let me take that back. He's not a professional wrestler. He's an amateur wrestler, but... The, 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 the super fun. WWE style wrestling. Cool. Yeah, for sure. Maybe, maybe we'll bring him on. It, one of my, uh, when I coached a demo team, uh, you know, way back when, um, I used to get comments all the time. They're like, Craig, you like professional wrestling, don't you? They were like choke slams and body slams. And oh, yeah, we had all sorts of tricks. Nice. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, um, this wraps it. So, folks listening, watching, Thanks for doing that. Thanks for, for being here, Craig. Thanks for coming on, Andrew. You're always around, but I appreciate you coming around again. It's always fun. As always. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, folks, if you want to support us, patreon.com slash whistlekick. 
podcast one five at whistlekick.com and of course the family page whistlekick.com slash family you got to type it in follow us on social media we're at whistlekick my email is jeremy at whistlekick.com if you want to get a hold of craig you can email me i'll pass it on so until next time let's see can we do this in sync train hard, train hard smile, smile and, and have, have a great, great, day. great day that was not in sync at all <laughs>